live on Facebook with a 30 second countdown. Okay. So just give me a couple minutes. Like I can just see this. So everybody that's tuning in, just waiting for it to go live. <clears throat> I don't see it yet. Hold up. One second. A minute. All right, perfect. So we are live on Facebook. So I'm going to just share it as well on my end. Bill, you're more than welcome to go to the Facebook page, The Danny Power Show. You can share it on your end as well. And I'm going to start a 30 second countdown. Okay. So I'll come back and introduce the show and yourself. Okay. Thank you so much. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Today is Tuesday, March 26, 2024. Welcome to the Danny Perro Show. Tonight, we are in the home studio. I am so excited to welcome my guest, Bill Abernathy. I I really need to appreciate the time and the dedication that you had given, given us. No, I need to order a number for the pet food real quick. Pet food, order number. Daniel, the people. No, they want the number. I'm oh, doing a show. I know, but they need the number. <laughs> Hold on, Bill. This is... I'm so oh, sorry. Is... I'm on the phone. Give me uh, one second. Oh, my God. You got... on. They just need the order number, Bill. Okay. I'm so sorry. Oh, my God. Oh, you're good. You're good. I, I am, I'm a tear. This it's is right there. This is life, right? This is what happens. Yeah. I'm so sorry. I will our, get right back to you in one second. Six, this is... Uh, yeah, I think we'll this is the reason why we start to show at 6 30. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, everybody that's tuning in, I'm so sorry. Just give me one second. I will start the show shortly. I'm just waiting on my. Everything good? Yeah, All right. All right. So we're going to get back. So we're so excited to have Bill here with us tonight. Now, Bill, we know you as being a wonderful musician living in Missouri. And we're so curious and, you know, excited to find out more about you today. So I do have to appreciate your time and dedication. Well, thank you for having me. And I'm excited to talk to y'all. This should be a good time. It definitely will be. So I want to get started a little bit for the show. Because every time I start a show, I like to get to know my guests behind bars. Versus what your biography is. Because I love talking to, get, talking to you to get to know who you are. So why don't we talk a little bit about in the beginning for yourself. When you kind of first got interested in music, how old were you? Uh, six. Okay. Six. And so it was a, you... it was a long time ago. That was about sixty years ago. So I wouldn't trust my memory to be exactly around six, but somewhere in that ballpark uh, is the first time that I uh, uh, tried to sing a song and, and play a guitar. Yeah. Oh, okay. So being younger, getting an idea of kind of like wanting to play guitar or be a singer at that age, what were you trying to pursue much? Were you looking into musician, like uh, in musical instruments? Were you looking more into vocal? Yeah, I had a brother who was a hippie. Uh, and uh, <laughs> literally, you know, and he had a, he had a bunch of friends, right. That, uh, that played music. Now he was, he was nine years older than me. So He's more of a, a child of the 60s as opposed to, uh, I call myself a child of the 70s. But uh, he used to have, you know, jam sessions, you know, uh, at the house. And all his older friends would come over and they'd sit around and play guitars and sing and, and do all that. And uh, uh, literally, uh, I would sneak out of my bedroom at, at night and go down and listen to them uh, play. And uh, okay. after, after a while, they kind of caught on to me. And so uh, they they let me came in, come in and listen to them, taught me a few things, and you know showed me a few little tricks here and there on the guitar. So uh, that's really where it, it all kind of got started for me. So you just getting an idea of sneaking downstairs and listening to the music. Now I know you said that they had like he's a hippie, so the music that they kind of have played was it similar to him being that as well? Was it hippie music? Not sure. They were into the folk music of the '60s, right? Okay. So you know the Dylan and Peter Paul Mix and Mary and. And, and those guys, you know, that was kind of their thing, right? So, Okay. So then tell me about when you first went downstairs and you got an opportunity to listen to them, right? 
were you excited to hear what they were playing? Were you excited and you wanted to be a part of it before you had gotten a chance to learn anything from your brother? Like you were thinking in the back end that this was something maybe you might want to do, or is it just for fun? Well, to be honest with you, I'd listened to them. And and the thing that fascinated me uh, more than, than, uh, you know, the guitar playing and all that were, were the songs themselves. Right. Uh, what the songs had to say, you know, back in, in the in those days, people didn't write the uh, so much of the baby, baby, baby. You know, I love you, love you, love you songs we get today. Oh my or, God, there's no well, I mean, OK, there's great love songs out there today, but there's yeah. nothing that is an old retro oldie, I guess you could say, where it means more than it being on the radio because we all remember it and we know it from a younger age versus like it just came out you know, last month and it's trying to trend on the topic or something like that on the billboard. Right. Right. And so they, they played more, they played more music that, that, you know, maybe had a little bit more social impact, had a bit more uh, the politics to it, you know? Uh, yeah. And uh, I always, always found that interesting. And, and they also played songs of, of the great storytellers uh, in, in the, uh, in the Very world. Music. And, and I loved, uh, listen to the lyrics and, and understanding the stories and then uh, trying to figure out uh, how to take those stories and turn them into music. So that that part fascinated me as much or more than anything else, I think. So when he taught you some stuff that you got a chance to learn, was it anything like on guitar? Was it anything vocally? Like, what did your brother teach you? I know this is still a young age, which I'm, I'm you know, working my way up to it, but I want to kind of get an idea as for you understanding and liking music at this age, what you think you wanted to do next? Yeah, so he played, but he was not very good, to be honest with you. Uh, he loved <laughs> it. Yeah, he loved it. You're but a modest had, musician, brother. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, you know, it is what it is. But he had some friends. Uh, one guy in particular was actually working on his PhD in guitar, who even knew that was a thing. Uh, but this guy was really, really good player and uh, excellent guy and really patient guy. And so he would he would spend a little time with me to show me a few tricks and and that kind of thing. And so uh, that that's really where I kind of picked up guitar. Uh, I took piano lessons and stuff when I was a kid. Uh, and so I could play that a little bit. But uh, the guitar is really where I, as you can see behind me, uh, that's real. That's where I live. Uh, so the guitar is a uh, wall of guitars behind you. You know, I'm going to ask you this later in the show. Yeah, that's that's most of them. But uh, uh, yeah, the guitar is where I really kind of find my thing. You know, I, I really like playing the guitar, and so uh, uh, that's where I landed. And that was something that you you like doing. So then, for guitar, is it something that you feel like you were growing up playing? Did you get taught properly as well? Did you get like um, lessons? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So I took lessons and and then I studied some guitar at the, the Kansas City Conservatory Music and, you know, worked with a bunch of guys that were far better, far better players than I. Uh, but they taught me things. They taught, yeah, they taught me things along the way. And uh, uh, as I as I say, I play just about well enough to impress the people that don't know. Uh, but if there are real musicians in the audience, you know, they, they kind of go, hey, yeah, well, you know, that's not so much. Right. But uh yeah, it sounds like I know what I'm doing. So I guess that's all it is. All, all you have to do today is create the illusion, right? So That's very true. I guess it also depends on the type of music and the lyrics part of the song for the illusion. Because you're right, anybody nowadays can just go on stage and pretend like they're playing. I mean, I'm not saying like pretend, but like, you know, look like they're doing a full-blown chord when it's just like e, maybe like an E minor or something like smaller. And it's not as extravagant as it's supposed to be, but it looks like it's like phenomenal, mind blowing to like everyone in the audience, you know? So that's pretty nice that you, you know, you can give that opportunity too. Yeah. Well, if you, uh, you know, there's a couple of musicians out now. Uh, I think they're in the country music world that wear these shirts that say uh, three chords and a bunch of truth. Right. Uh, when you come to hear me play or when you listen to some of my music, there's a few more than three chords, just saying. So it's it's a little oh, bit no, more complex true. than most. Yeah. Yeah. No, you can definitely hear a lot more uh, mentality in your music that'll, you know, versus what's on the radio as well. But it's also how you want to explain yourself as a musician. I mean, who are some of the inspirations that got you into being a country musician? 
Well, you call me a country musician. I don't know that I'm necessarily a country musician. So I, I don't really like being put in a box, right? So, uh, for example, uh, you know, I've won uh, uh, awards for best rock album of the year. I've won awards for Americana. They're currently calling me folk rock, whatever that is. So, uh, okay. uh, yeah, so, but, uh, uh, you know, I just think that that uh, I'm not a big fan of being put in a box. So. Uh, Country music today is not what country music used to be, and you know things evolved. So it's it's really hard to keep up with it to figure out what box you put in. But uh, on the Moore album, I actually play seven different genres, and I did it on purpose just to mess with the guys on radio. So yeah. Okay. Well, what I want to say about that though is when you you don't want to put yourself in a box, right, for your genre. But explain to me exactly what you want your genre to be versus like Americana. Then you said pop, a little bit of reggae. Uh, country, what would you consider your genre to be? If you had a name for it, what would you like to name it? Old hippie music. <laughs> Old hippie music. You know what? That's I, I have to say, I really do like that because <laughs> you can make it anything you want it to be, right? Exactly. Probably- exactly. That makes it original. That makes it yours. Uh, nobody can steal it from you. I mean, they can steal the name Old Hippie Music because I'm sure many people, you know, use that name. But if you have a you know, your certain uh, authentication on it, they can't take it away from you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I just think that, uh, you know, my kind, my thing is really lyric-based music, right? So uh, to me, the lyrics are important and uh, telling the story and the information behind the song is, is what's important. And then the music comes later uh, to kind of match whatever the story is. So if, if the story lends itself to be a rock and roll song, then, then I write rock and roll music. If it's a folk song, I'll write folk music. And uh, or Americana, which nobody knows what is, uh, that, you know, I will try to eat. Well, nobody really does know what Americana is. So, uh, but I'll try to, I'll try to stay in those worlds. Yeah, exactly. But do you also think it's the way that you play your guitar, like the way you want to make it into that song? Cause I'm sure you can't, I'm sure you could just wake up and be like, I want to write a folk song today and then just go right from that. But is it like easier for you for lyrics? Is it easier for you for the, the, musical part like the chords does that come quicker that depends so yeah though no, when i write i always write lyrics first always always okay. always and right. and uh it, it's to me it's like a story right uh if you have something to say which hopefully you do if you're going to write a song um uh, if you have something to say then you need to figure out how to say it right and so i focus really a lot uh, 80% of my time probably uh, with songwriting is, is focused on lyrics and telling the story and making it, you know, appropriate. And so that uh, the information and the ideas that I'm trying to share with people are clear uh, in, in the lyric itself. And then the music itself kind of tells me the song, uh, the lyrics kind of tell me what the music uh, should be. If it should be a, like a folky kind of song or it should be a rock and roll song or a blues song or, you know. Whatever. Okay, so you did but, a few uh, with, it, with the lyrics, okay. Yeah, yeah, to me, the lyrics are the most important part. So why don't you explain to me about uh, similar, I want to say, like when you're creating a hook for your song? Because, uh, you know, a lot of musicians always try to make sure the hook is the most catchiest, gets stuck in our heads. Uh-huh. When you when you had become a musician and you got an idea of that for songwriting, did that seem, I don't want to say did it seem stressful, but did that seem like, something where it was hard to go with at first no or is it easy for you to write a hook yeah it depends on on you know how you want to classify a hook but at the end of the day the hook's really the idea of the song like for example um i have a song called you can't go back okay that's not a standard hook but it's the hook for that song because uh you know that's kind of what pulls the song together you know if you look at uh the more album um you know, they're the, each, every one of those songs has its own hook. So, uh, but it's not, uh, maybe sometimes they're not the standard hook that you'd hear on the radio where, you know, you hear the same line over and over and over and over and over again. Uh, that's, that's so really annoying. not, not my way. Uh, if you don't, if you don't have a good hook and the only way that you can uh, make it a good hook is by repeating it nine times in the midst of a chorus, then maybe that's, you should look for something different. Just say it. So, you know what? That's completely honest in the industry because I feel like 
nowadays when people are looking to write music, uh, the inspirations, there's not that many, there's inspirations out there, but there's not that many amazing inspirations for people to look into. It also depends what type of music that they like. I am a huge country musician fan and I like, you know, regular oldies, pop, anything mm -hmm. on the radio, as long as it's not profanity, like radio friendly, basically. And, you know, I feel like that's another thing with musicians. Sometimes it's hard for them to not curse in a song. And they think that them putting the curse word in a song is going to make them millions and millions of dollars when people like me is just going to turn it off because I don't want to hear that. You know, like yeah, it's yeah, sometimes it's a marketing ploy. Right. Uh, so, uh, you know, if you if you cuss, uh, which I don't necessarily uh, on on, well, you're on the show, but, you made the cut. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Uh, <laughs> but if, if you do, if you do have curse words. Uh, on your record, then you get to get one of those little stickers that says explicit lyrics, right? And uh, there are people that shop for that, you know, that that's a, it's a marketing thing. So that's what it is, a business. So no, I understand. I completely do. Well, I just wanted to say, um, because I know we were talking a little bit about yourself and your bio and everything in the beginning, you know, how you started when you were six. Shortly after that, can I ask, did you do any like theater or choirs or anything growing up music wise? Yeah, so when I was young, uh, I was involved in a lot of church groups, uh, and uh, I was always the youngest, the youngest guy in the group. Sometimes the, the folks in the groups were several years older than me, and uh, uh, we traveled uh, all over the United States and played, you know, these big old churches and, and youth camps and you know that kind yeah. of thing. And uh, uh, I was always given an opportunity uh, during those performances to play and sing with just my guitar. And uh, that's uh, that's kind of always been a thing for me. So, you know, we did the whole church thing and big tracks and, you know, the uh, uh, productions. Right. Uh, but mm -hmm. at the end of the day, when uh, when it was my turn to just sit down with my guitar and, and play a song, that was really my favorite thing. So I did all that. And then, of course, you get into school and uh, you, know, you do different things in school. You're, you know, you're in choirs and these little special yeah. groups and uh, madrigals and, you know, and all this other stuff. And so you did all that, you know, more vocal stuff. But even then, uh, the music director uh, at my high school, at the great big high school, and and uh, he knew that I could, I could play my guitar and sing a little bit. So even with the special groups, when we go out to perform for, you know, the chambers of commerce or, you know, the rotary clubs or whoever, uh, he would yeah, always yeah. let me, he, he would Thanks always let that. me bring my guitar. He'd always let me bring my guitar and sing something I wanted to sing, uh, as long oh, as it was, was within reason. So yeah, that's, that's so sweet. So he was like right by your side, just letting you like watching you grow with that. Well, I think that I, it wasn't necessarily watching me grow. He liked uh, uh, he, he liked me kinda. Uh, he liked the fact that I could play and sing and, and play a different style of music than most of those groups were listening to. Uh, and we're yeah. used to getting from a from a school group. So, yeah, he let me do that. It was kind of fun. Awesome. Well, I love that. I just wanted to know, curious if you were any like any theater or choir groups, because I feel like also when you are a singer at a young age, we like to go and do different things, whether it's like choir or try to be in theater, just everything vocaling for yourself when you're getting older, but also getting the experience, right? Whether it's on your resume, whether you get an opportunity to sing in front of somebody or practicing at a young age to be a musician to where you are now, you know? So it's always things hidden that a lot of musicians don't mention and talk on their bio. And I feel like me being on my show, I like to pull up the past, not the negative past, just, you know, the young past. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't, don't air your dirty laundry, right? But the answer to your question is yes. So I did all of those things. I was in stage productions and, you know, we performed Oklahoma and, and uh, you know, all these other things. And so, you know, I was I was on stage when I was a baby, you know, and I was seven, eight, to ten years old. I was on stage in front of hundreds of people. And so uh, the whole being in front of stage and, and, and being in front of people is something that is just I've just done my whole life. So it's uh, it's not a thing for me. It's fun. You're used to it. Exactly. Now, when yeah. you were younger, when people asked you what you want to be when you grew up, what did you say? Did you say musician? <laughs> uh, that, not usually. So there was a time in my life when I wanted to be a football player. Okay. Uh, and then uh, then I realized I didn't have the correct DNA for that. 
so I spent uh, quite a bit of time getting fixed from broken parts uh, from trying to play football and, and other sports. And uh, uh, and and then then I realized that you know I could I could go out and have a really good time and play my guitar and sing and uh, enjoy all that and kind of get a similar buzz uh, that you get from uh, you know playing sports. And at the end of the night, you're not you're not hurt. You don't have to go to the doctor and get parts put back together, you know. So uh, that's kind of when I did it. Uh, during high school, probably is what I decided that was more that was more my thing. And did you like because you know wanting to be a musician or growing up where you are now? Did you go to college for anything like that? Sure, I want a scholarship for a vocal a vocal scholarship to go to school, and so I did that for a little bit. Can't say that I stayed long. Uh, but I did that for a little bit, but I studied guitar in, in uh, college and all that. So, okay. So you probably learned a lot more depth of it. Guitar. -wise. Yeah. You learn, you learn all the technical stuff. Right. And then, uh, then once you, once you graduate and you get done with that, it takes you a little while to forget all that technical stuff and just sit back and play. So okay. that said, that said, uh, I still use it, uh, from time to time, particularly if yeah, yeah. Particularly if I'm writing something that's really intricate, you know, you you uh, you need to get back into the theory and do the math, right? Do the math for the music, and and uh, sometimes I have to do that. So it's a good thing that I know it, uh, okay. but uh, it's also so a good thing that I that I got away from it. I I was fortunate. I was talking to somebody about this the other day. I was fortunate that my uh, favorite guitar teacher uh, that I had uh, when I was in school uh, would make me learn you know, the technical stuff, you know, the Bach and the Beethoven, and you know, those things. He would make me learn that okay. and uh, make me play it note for note, right? Uh, but then uh, when I had that where he was happy with it, he'd let me, he would encourage me to play with it, play around with it. Don't play it like it's written. Play around with it, you know, make see what you can do with it. Well, I hate Sorry. that term, but yeah, play around with it. Play around with it and see what uh, see what you would do differently than this person did when they wrote the song. And so uh, I, I give him a lot, a lot of credit, a lot of credit for that, because uh, I think a lot of times uh, you could get locked into the technical world and forget that uh, yeah, music's art and it's supposed to be feelings. And uh, uh, you can't have feelings coming off of a piece of paper, in my opinion. So uh, no, you're right yeah. about that. Feel it on a yeah. guitar. Feel it on a singer. Yep. Yep. And exactly. Cool. You know, like you said, you were writing songs where you, you want a message to be spoken. You want us to feel something. You want to explain a story of a lover and somebody that passed away and they're grieving to this day, but it's a beautiful song. You want a message. And a lot of the music that does come out nowadays versus yourself, they don't always give messages anymore. I think like we were saying a little bit before with the hook, they're more repetitive where they're just stuck in our heads where mm -hmm. I don't even know what I'm singing. Like uh, I'll be singing a commercial, like a jingle on a commercial, you know? Yeah, exactly. And, and don't, don't get me wrong. I don't, I don't say that that's a bad thing. I mean, that that's people are making money and, and having careers and doing all that. Right. And I don't say that's a bad thing. You know, yeah. I, it's a different thing. It's a way it different is. thing from what I like to do. So, uh, but it's I'm like not, if you uh, want to write a song as a musician, having a story or the three parts to the story where it's the beginning, the middle and end. None of that happens in a lot of the, the songs, you know, nowadays, too. We all write them differently. And so yeah. sometimes you can write half the story. But I feel like there's not that much storytelling moving forward with a lot of musicians. You know, bring it back. People need to. Bring yeah, it back. I am doing all I can. I'm doing everything I can. So bring it back. <laughs> Not holding you accountable, Bill. I understand that completely. I know that. There for you sure. go. There Definitely. you go. So I'm curious for that amazing, beautiful wall behind you of your guitars. If you would explain to me what's going on behind you. Well, I'm an acoustic guitar guy, uh, though Hi. I have though I have uh, electric guitars and I use them. Uh, but uh, for the most part, I'm an acoustic guitar guy. So uh, probably the best analogy is is that if you go see uh, a guy that's an electric player, okay, they have a pedal board underneath their feet, right? And they're going to push, you know, different pedals and engage different, different sounds and different effects and, and different, and, and they do that all with these pedals, right? Uh, I don't use pedals uh, at all. I just, if I want a different song, I just go find a new guitar. So that's kind of 
it's kind of my thing. So every every one of my guitars has a, a different feel and a different sound, and and uh, they deliver to me at least uh, a different feel. So that's why I have them all. Well, I wanted to know if they were all like you you use them. I'm sure throughout your career, but they all mean something to you, right? Did you name all of them? Of course I did. They're behind uh, you uh, for a certain reason. So. What? I said they're behind you for a certain reason. So I was just curious. Yeah, I don't know. Each one of them has a name. Uh, and, and those names come from some different places. So uh, let's see. I, I have uh, two guitars that are kind of unique. They're handmaids uh, and they're nine string guitars. So, you know, typically a guitar is six string or 12 strings. Uh, these are nine string guitars. Uh, and uh, the one that I play the most that I've had the longest of those, I just call him the mutant because he's different, you know, the different okay. than all the other guitars. Um, I have another guitar that I'll test your I'll test your Lord of the Rings knowledge here. I have another guitar that's called Galadriel. Uh, so do you know who that is? I, I do not. Is that from Lord of the Rings as That's well? That's what he's talking about, yeah. Yeah. It is, yeah, Galadriel. So she's a, uh, she's a female guitar because uh, they have genders. But anyway, uh, she's all blonde. She's absolutely beautiful. Uh, she loves uh, to be played in very pretty situations and with very pretty songs. Uh, but uh, if you piss her off, she could get a little angry with you. So uh, much like uh, Galadriel in the movies. Pardon me? Is she the folk guitar for the pretty, beautiful music? Uh, she's kind of, uh, uh, it, it, it depends on the song again. But yeah, she's kind of a love song guitar, right? That's She's okay. really good at that. You know, finger picking and, you know, all the fancy stuff that goes along with that. You know, she's good at that. Uh, then I have uh, my 1974 Guild F512. Uh, guitar, which is the same one, uh, same gotcha. make, model, uh, and year that uh, like John Denver played one, Dan Fogelberg played one, Stephen Stills played one. They're they're just the year, make, and model uh, of a twelve string that everybody wants, right? And uh, I call him the dude. Uh, so I'm again going to test your movie movie knowledge. So who is the dude? The dude. Okay. Can I get ask, like ask your dad? You could call a friend. Yeah. What is the dude? Call a friend. The dude? I'm trying to remember. Can I get like bubble letters? Or not bubble letters. Um, <laughs> like three three um, clues. Clues. Or like three, I'd like, you know, like choose one from. I'm not following. No, I'll give you, I'll give you clues to the movie. How's that? Yes. Okay. This rug really makes the room. This rug really makes the room. I feel like I'm playing trivia. <laughs> how, how old is this movie? Pretty old. Uh, let's see. Second clue. Jeff Bridges. Dad, you have to help me with this. I don't know what this means. I haven't seen many Jeff Bridges movies. This rug really makes the room? The dude? Yeah, the dude. One more clue. So it's, One more clue. It's, well, you're not going to get it. So I, I'm going to just tell you. So it's from the movie. The Big Lebowski. Oh, okay. That, yeah, Somebody about the, just about said the bowler. About the bowler. Exactly. Exactly. And he had a good friend the, said the Big Lee, I guess. Yeah, Lebowski. But, yeah. Yeah, but the the reason that I named that particular car, guitar the dude is because the famous line uh, from that movie, uh, Jeff Bridges says, "The dude abides." Well, that guitar, when I pick him up and play him, you know it. Yep. The dude abides. Yep. So that's why I named him the dude. Uh, so you have I have a new thing. one. I have the newest one uh, uh, that is a Martin um, that I just call Strider. So if if uh, again, that's a Lord of the Rings reference. Okay, Chris would know so, all of this. I've never seen one. How about any Marvel no. guitars, Bill? Any what? Marvel guitars? Marvel? Marvel, like the no, like I, the. TV show. Like TV oh, show. oh, no, 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 no. There's, like, there's not enough. Uh, I love those movies. They're great entertainment, right? Yeah. yeah but there's no, there's not enough depth in those movies to really name something after, in my opinion. So, uh, yeah, yeah, but Strider is, is uh, by newest guitar, and he, uh, 
Uh, he ended up being, uh, that was his, uh, his working name in the movie, but he ended up being Aragorn, which turns into the king. So, yeah. So each one of them has a story I could go on all night long, but yeah, that's kind of the idea. I love that though. I love how honest you are about your guitars. Now, Vinny, that's tuning in. I just wanted to say he's one of our good friends from Jersey Calling, which is also a band we just previously had on our show last year. I'm sorry. Couple, last week. Last week. <laughs> Not last, last year. Last year. Last week. Um, they are like a pop punk band. So I just wanted to say he said, don't ever say that the big Lebowski is ever old again, old ever again. Old ever again, Bill. And he laughed. You know, there, are, <laughs> there are movies that should never go away and and I actually had a, a friend of mine who's roughly my age. So I'm 66, right? So I've been around a bit. Uh, but uh, they had never they had never seen the big Lebowski. And uh, I, I told them, they said, uh, well, we should sit down and watch it together. And I said, oh, no, you have to watch this on your own. And then if you want to watch it with me, then we can discuss it. So, you know, it's... Uh, eh. It's, it's I, gotta say, I still never saw it, Bill. I'd never even heard of it. I heard of it, but I, I, I was busy doing other things in life. I just, I I don't sit and watch movies all the time. So I didn't know. I, I heard about it, but I never saw it. So. Well, let's see what you got to do is now, now you have a, uh, you've got a teaser, right? You can watch the movie and you can figure out where the line, the room or the rug really makes ties in the room. The rug really makes the room. Now you, and you have to figure out what that means. I mean, when you said that, I was thinking of Aladdin, but that's the only thing I can think of that was a shoot, like a rug. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess we're going to look into watching that movie sometime. I don't even know. There what you go. Called, so. Who's in that movie besides Jeff Bridges? Oh, uh, there's a bunch of people, and I am absolutely horrible with names, and so I'm not even oh, going to okay. try. Uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, uh, it, I'm terrible with names. It's a 70s thing. Uh, but, uh, you know, there's a song on my new record that could, that's called the seventies were a little hard on me. And that's one of the things that evidently left me, uh, in the seventies was my ability to remember people's names. But, uh, uh, yeah, there's a bunch of guys in it. So John Goodman's in it. I mean, there's, there's a bunch of folks. It's great. Well, movie. Also Woody Harrelson, I think from, uh, Cheers is in there. I don't know if Woody's in it or not. I, I don't remember him being in it, but anyway, okay. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I wanted to know um, if you could tell me a little bit about your album uh, that came out in 2017, Find a Way. I wanted to talk a little bit about your album. Yeah, Find a Way. Uh, completely switching terms now <laughs> off your guitar. Yeah, yeah. Now yeah, off we go. Well, Find a Way uh, is an album that was really inspired. Uh, the title cut of the album was inspired by the day that my dad passed away, actually. And. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, Oh, thank you. It's been since 1989, so it's been a bit. But uh, um, I was at work, uh, and I got, he was in the hospital. He was not doing well, and and uh, we all kind of knew, you know, that it was inevitable. And and my sister called me and said, "You need to come to the hospital uh, and come now because you know it's inevitable." So I finished up what I was doing, about 10 minutes worth of work, and I took off and and uh, went to the hospital. And uh, I missed seeing my dad that day. Uh, by about five minutes, uh, because you know I had to finish up what I was doing at work. So let's let's just say that I prioritized my time pretty poorly that day. But uh, uh, the the concept behind Find a Way is something that uh, that he taught me. It's a saying that he said to me many 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 times uh, in life, and he said that if you want something bad enough in life, and you're willing to put in the blood, the sweat, the tears, and the toil. You can always find a way to make it happen. And uh, since Find A Way was my first uh, really full produced album, I had produced an acoustic album prior to that, but uh, that was kind of my way to find a way. Uh, and uh, interestingly enough, at the end of uh, that song, the, the title cut, uh, my dad uh, had a favorite song that he liked to hear me play on the guitar. It was called The Wildwood Flower. You know, it's an old, old classic thing. And uh, classic country bluegrassy thing almost, and uh, uh, he loved it. He loved it when I would play that for him. And so, for the outtake of the, uh, the Find a Way song, I played a, a pure acoustic version uh, of the Wildwood Flower uh, on my twelfth string uh, as kind of my way to find a way to tell my dad that I loved him one more time. So. That's beautiful. That's, that's so, I, I'm guessing with that album, 
being the way that it is as well, it's dedicated to your father as well, correct? 2017. Uh, yeah, yeah, the site's dedicated to my dad, but it's really uh, the focus of the album itself outside of that song is really about finding balance. Uh, you know, at, the, at that time I was still working, you know, I did this whole 43 and a half year long corporate gig. And it was really hard to balance uh, what I did in my corporate world and, and what I do in the music world and uh, to make time, you know, to carve out time for each one of those and make sure that they didn't cross paths. Yeah, make sure they didn't cross paths and, and you know, you lose prioritization and all that. And so uh, it was a little bit about finding a balance. The whole the whole album is about finding a balance. But that balance is what I lost the day that my dad passed away. I worked when I should have not. So I lost balance. And so that's what that that's what that album is all about. Now, what was your corporate job? What were you doing as well as? I worked for a, yeah, I worked for a, a large uh, international uh, company uh, and uh, I worked in the supply chain field, but I was really more of a program manager. Uh, so what we would do is I had a team of uh, expert people uh, that worked with me and, and uh, we would uh, different production sites and administrative sites and warehousing and distribution sites would, would call it, they would have a problem. Uh, with something and uh, we would go and figure out what the problem was then figure out a solution and then implement the solution so uh, we did a whole lot of uh, business process uh, validation uh, and uh, investigation and remodeling and then uh, we would always find a way to uh, integrate the new solutions into the technical systems uh, that the, that the company used so yeah what I did technical and everything so I'm guessing not even that day, but sometimes the job could be very complicated or just <laughs> yeah. takes up so much time that you had no time in between for anything else. Right? Yeah, I had, we had, I, yeah, I had projects that lasted six years. Yeah, they were pretty complex, a lot of them. Yeah. 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 I was going to say, you're also a father, correct, though? I am. I have two kids and three grandkids. So. Oh, I, yeah. love that. I think that's amazing. That's so sweet. Real quick, we had Vinny that also um, came from Jersey calling. He said, beautiful sentiment, Bill. I just want to say that he was just, you know, that was very sweet what you said about your dad. That's a true story. And he's over, he's looking over you today about this interview. You know, he's so proud of you. Yeah. Would you like to hear a really cool story about that? I would love to. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I was on tour. I was playing in Estes Park. And kind of a listing room environment, two, 300 people. And uh, I always, even to this day, the last song that I play in any of my concerts is this song called Find Away. And uh, yeah. there was a guy there sitting stage right. I could see him just like it was yesterday. And he was one of these guys that, that he was locked and loaded through the whole concert. I mean, his full eye contact, there was nobody with him. He sat by himself and he was just really, really interested. Uh, in, in uh, you know, what I was playing and, and the songs and what they were yeah. saying and all that. And I thought, how cool. And then after the show, I got kind of tied up with a bunch of people and I didn't get, I was going to go over and talk to him. I didn't get a chance to. And three days later, I played in, uh, I don't remember the name of the town, but someplace in Southern Colorado. And okay. as I came out, <laughs> there he was, same guy, four hours away, right? Uh, same guy, same situation, locked and loaded through the whole concert and just really made a uh, uh, very focused, very focused on what I was doing. And uh, so I made a point as soon as the show was over, I set my guitars down. I went over to talk to him and uh, I said, hey, listen, man, you know, I appreciate you coming to two shows, but this is like four hours away from the other show. And uh, he said, yeah, I, I needed to hear that song one more time because I like it acoustic much better than I like it on the record. And I thought, which song, which song was that? And he said, your find a way song. Mm -hmm. And I said, uh, well, that, you know, you know you're kind of honored when somebody says that, you know? And uh, I said, well, I appreciate you really like the song. And he said, well, what I really like about it is my dad passed away three weeks ago and uh, your song really speaks to me and uh, is wow. helping me through, helping me through this situation. And uh, oh yeah. True story. So that that's when I knew that uh, that tour was now an official success. I had, I had actually contacted, uh, made contact 
interpersonal contact with someone. Uh, and they had really appreciated my music, but uh, yeah. And whether they were, they were probably just somebody that didn't know who you were right first. And they. Well, that, I was getting a lot of radio airplay uh, in, in those areas. Okay. That's why, that's why I toured out there. And so, and the find, the find a way song did pretty well. Uh, it hit a bunch of charts in the top 10 and, you know, and all that. And so uh, uh, I think people had heard it, but they had heard the produced version, you know, uh, there's quite a yeah. bit of, you know, rock and roll and all that involved in it uh, in the produced version. But when it's uh, just me and a guitar, which is, the way that I like to tour, uh, it's it, it's kind of got a different feel. It's more like how I wrote it, you know? So uh, I, I think it's a little more touchy-feely when I just play it acoustic. Do you have it acoustically recorded as well? Uh, yeah. Like for radio stations to play? Uh, no, uh, no, I didn't do that on that record. Uh, I did that on the more record. On the latest record, I have two songs uh, on that record that uh, not only did we record the full produced orchestrated stuff, uh, but we also just recorded it with me and a guitar. And they're they're pretty they're pretty popular. People seem to like them. So um, something that I would probably do more of. Yeah. Okay. Because leaning forward um, into that as well, I would probably say even after the show, I'll have Chris contact Michael, and then we can also get both songs or whatever you have acoustically that you want to play here on Hamilton radio. Mm -hmm. We can play that as well, whether it's sure. not acoustic or just your regular album, that's completely fine too. But whatever you want to give us to play, that's your, you know, the, your opportunity, your option. We can give you airplay too, because we're all over the world. Oh, so okay, cool. Play, cool. You know, Australia and everywhere else <laughs> with that option. So I, I have a lot of, I have a lot of fans in Australia, actually. I get quite a bit of airplay in Australia now. Good. That's awesome. So we can give you more. Cool. We're all over the world. So we would love to, you know, take your music and bring it up higher to the highest fields we can. So very cool. Appreciate that. Of course. So after the interview, we'll get all that information or we can contact you and then contact Michael and go from there. Okay. But I just wanted to do that option because, you know, you were talking about how you had that song and the song from your when you wrote for your, you know, as well as like goodbye to your dad. And a lot of that would also be, it's probably very emotional. Sure, you get emotional when you play it on stage. Now, do you ever yeah. feel like he's there with you? Can you feel him? Of course. Of course. Of course. Of course. That's what right. I wanted to so, do. A lot of people would be creeped out if I said that, but I wanted to make sure. <laughs> well, I think that, that when you're a songwriter, right? Uh, when you write a song, there's a reason that you wrote it, right? And, and yeah. uh, they typically have, you know, some deep meaning or, you know, you've been through something and, you know, whatever. Uh, yeah. and, and the key to me uh, when you perform those live is to go back to that space, go back to that place that you were when you wrote that song, when you had that idea, uh, when you were working through it and kind of revisit, you know, all those thoughts and those emotions and stuff that uh, that were going on when you wrote it. And that's really how, Bill's opinion, you can deliver the song uh, the best, in my opinion. Well, I love that. I think that's beautiful. And, you know, how we had mentioned your album that came out in 2017. I wanted to also talk a little bit more about your previous um, release of your album that you were talking about when you were off air as well. So what is the name of this album that you had released? Uh, the newest one um, is called uh, More, M-O-R-E. It's just called More. And uh, uh, it came out in September of 23. Um, okay, so and it's... Uh, yeah, so it's it's pretty fresh. Uh, it's had now. This is uh, the third single. The third single now off that record is, has been released. And so it's done. It's done really well. The first single is a song called "Hideaway" uh, that Hi. hit number one on hit number one on the iTunes charts in on in the UK and uh, did really well here in the United States. Uh, the second one is a really touching song. Uh, that's called uh, that's named called their name and it's really a uh, a song that talks about uh the travesty in the united states that we have regarding homeless people uh it's it's ludicrous to me that uh that we have homeless people out in our our world when we're supposed to be you know the usa and all that and 
And yeah. uh, it's uh, it's a sad thing, but it's done very well. Uh, it's it's number one right now, uh, actually, on uh, the Independent Music Network and the National Radio Hits uh, Adult Contemporary Chart, which is another one of those genres that nobody knows what it is, but whatever. Uh, but uh, yeah, I'll, you're wrong. That's what it is. yeah, yeah, I'll take a number one wherever I could get it. Right, I've had a few. Right, so it's always good to get more. Right, that's awesome. Uh, that's yeah. really good. Yeah. So then. Yeah. Talking a little bit about this album, how many tracks was on the on more? Uh, there's nine. Two of them are pure acoustic re redos, right? Okay, so, this is the one you were talking about. Yeah. Yeah. So the, there's two uh, songs. The Calder Name song uh, has a beautiful guitar part uh, that I play on Miss Galadriel. Uh, that uh, is just it's really pretty, right? And and the song's yeah. very touching, and so. Uh, we decided that that uh, the hit, you know, the one that's out on the radio is all produced up in strings and, you know, all this stuff, uh, which is really pretty and it's really cool. Uh, but uh, we decided we wanted to do that one just acoustic, uh, just me and a guitar. So we did that and it's really cool. Uh, and then the title cut uh, for the, the album uh, is more, it's a, it's a, oh, uh, you know, you hear about, uh, singer songwriter songs, right? Where, where the, you're just you're, you just kind of split open your chest to pull out your heart and hang it out here and let people shoot nails at it and you know tear it apart and all that. That's kind of what uh, the Moore song is all about. It is it's a challenge uh, it, yeah. if there can be more, if there can be more than a friend or more than a lover, right? Uh, in a relationship, and so. Uh, we did we did the very similar thing it's uh the the single for more that's uh, on the radio now is uh pretty produced it's got everything on it uh and we had a lot of fun doing it. it's really pretty uh but we decided at the end of the day i just want a version of that with me and my guitar and so we did that too i think so. you know what honestly an acoustic is i don't want to say better but i feel like an acoustic is so fresh that it's you and your vocals, you know, your vocals and the music that you want to play, obviously the guitar, so acoustic. And it, it just gets to show you a little bit about your voice, like what you can do with it, how you wanted to make it sound. And I mean, I also, don't get me wrong, we all love, you know, uh, music that's recorded or different tracks and stuff you have behind it and all mm -hmm. the different musical instruments. But as we were saying before, acoustic is so fresh that you don't hear it a lot nowadays. And I don't feel like a lot of musicians do it that much, honestly. Yeah, I think they should do more. But I think that that uh, it makes it more personal. That, that's what I think, is when you, hear a, when you hear a song, like those two songs in particular are very, you know, heart-wrenching, thoughtful, you know, kind of deep, deep yeah. songs, right? And uh, when you hear them, but just, you know, a, a, a good acoustic guitar and, and some vocals, I think it's just it's just more personal. It's more touching. So this from the guy I, I that's just, got not 13 old acoustic guitars. You know, I like them. So, yeah, I'm yeah. going to use them, right? Oh, oh, my God, of course you are. I wanted to say um, a little bit about your album more, where people can find it. Are you all over, um, like, you had mentioned you were on iTunes. Are you on like Spotify? Are you on all over? Sure. Yeah. So I'm like a bad rash. I'm all over and I won't go away. So <laughs> you can find, if you can't find my music, you're not looking. That's all. That's all I can tell you. It's everywhere. And, uh, uh, you know, you can, you can find it on, you know, whatever streaming platform you use, what, you know, whatever iTunes, Pandora, whoever, Amazon, whoever you buy stuff from, uh, it's there. It's there. Series? Sirius yes, I, I'm on Sirius Radio sometimes. You know, it's pretty picky to get on Sirius Radio, but yeah, I've heard my stuff you on Sirius it. Radio Yay. time too. That's awesome. Congratulations. Yeah. Thanks. When you get the highest achievements where you get to be on more of FM radio stations, I mean, as a musician, because you know that's like the, the that's what that's what your goal is, right? You want to be on all the radio stations and get number one on everything. Mm. When you were first heard on a radio station, let's say you heard yourself. What was going through your mind? What were you, what were you excited? Were you confused? What was going on? 
So the story goes, I had made this record. It was the first one. And I had this one song that was called Willow Creek, which talks about when I was a kid, where I was yes. born, where I was raised, where I learned to play music, where I learned all the stuff that, that we talked a bit about earlier. Right. Yes. Uh, and that's that's what that song's about. And uh, I was driving uh, out in the middle of Utah uh, one day. Yes. Working, you know, when I was doing my. I'm gonna say job. randomly in Utah, but then you said working. I'm radio, right? Did you pull and over? Did you sing to your sing with yourself? No, I actually sat there and listened to it and said, "Damn, I should have done that better," you know. But you know, that's what you, you do. When you're okay, musician. you criticize yourself. Okay, okay. Of course, yeah. You always, yeah, always be your worst critic, right? You can, but I think you can also be proud of yourself too. Well, yeah, it's a cool thing. I mean, it's a moment, right? It's like, uh, yes. you know, you have some of those, you know, when you're when you're a, a musician, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, the first time I saw it, you know, the first number one song, I had a, a song off the Find A Way album uh, that was number one yes. folk song in the United States for about seven weeks, you know, on the Roots Music Charts. And that's a thing, you know, that's a deal. That's a big deal. Um, I remember when I was on tour right after, right before COVID, uh, seeing yourself on a billboard. That's a thing. That's a moment, right? That's one that of is? those things that you, you, that you kind of remember. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, th th there's those moments, but I, I don't know that any of them are, are any cooler than the first time you hear yourself on the radio. That's pretty sweet. It's pretty but sweet. being on a billboard is also extremely awesome. What were you on a billboard for? Advertising my tour. So. Your music? Yeah, my tour and my music and all that stuff, right? So that so tour came. To see yourself on a billboard was that like bringing you to tears? Well, I wouldn't say tears, but it it, it was cool. Not emotional. <laughs> well, sure. You know, you're kind of like, oh wow, that's cool. You know, uh, you know, but the, okay. yeah, we yeah. that tour was promoting the Crossing Willow Creek album that had like six different songs on it that charted all over the world and did great. You know, okay. and so. Uh, yeah, that's why we were touring to support that record. But yeah, yeah, I pulled into a couple of places, actually, some of the places. So when I pulled into Colorado, there was a billboard. When I pulled into New Mexico, uh, there was another billboard that I happened to see. I think there were more, but I uh, happened to see those. And uh, it's, okay. it's, 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 it's a thing, so awesome. you know, yeah, that's, that's a cool thing. Accomplishment. It's a cool that's thing. That's definitely, a, that's definitely an accomplishment. And I feel like as a musician, when you get a chance to see that, you made it. Well, I don't know that you made it, but it's cool. You know, it's a cool thing. So yeah, it was fun. Yeah, I took a picture. A, you I made have pictures. <laughs> exactly. You have yeah. pictures in front of it or your pictures just you witnessing it? Uh, it's a picture of me in front of the billboard. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's an accomplishment. That's a praise. That's something. Yeah, that's a cool that's thing. Fun. It's fun. <laughs> so, yeah, it's definitely something that's, um, off the whim exciting and maybe something that happens i want to say in that time because of the you know the tour promotions and everything like that but we can make it bigger and better think of yourself being on number one on everything you know and yeah well I, you know I, 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 how do i say this in a nice way um uh it's really expensive to be number one on a lot of things, right? Uh, I understand. So, okay, uh, not messing up with this world situation right now. It's probably worse. But back in the day, it was cheaper, I'm sure. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. Yeah. And it, that's all really back in the day. You could actually make money, you know, playing music, which, you know, nobody could do anymore. So that's uh, so sad. That's well, so sad. you have to tour, you know, you just, you just have to incessantly tour if you want to make money and I'm 66 and uh, I don't want to. So there's that. Well, okay. <laughs> so off air, we were talking, cause I know we weren't doing this on air off air. We were talking about when you perform at venues to certain venues that you prefer versus like a bar or anything. Can we bring that up again? Because I do want the audience members to understand just how amazing what your preference is, is actually what I miss. I feel like every time I go out, I am going to a bar to want to listen to music. Mm -hmm. And you know, the worst thing is whether they have the TVs, they always have music playing when the musicians are playing. Mm -hmm. It's so stupid. Yeah, I'm old, man. So I, I remember when you went to a concert to go to a concert. 
right? Yeah. And even if you went to a coffee house, right, it was still a concert type uh, yeah. environment, right? Where people would just sit down and shut up and listen to the guy, you know, that was right. playing or the folks that were playing. But uh, yeah, I don't play in bars. I'm not going to go play in bars. I won't play in any place that has televisions, uh, pinball machines, video games. No, I'm not doing that. And, uh, you know, I'm fortunate that I don't have to, you know, uh, people that, that uh, are, are doing the music gig full time and, you know, try to make a living and all that. That's that's their choices. A lot of times yeah. uh, I don't necessarily have to do that. So or I, if I, they have an agent or a manager, they would book them there because they would make money off. Well, yeah, it's all about making money. Right. But but I uh, I, I don't like playing those places uh, and I, I don't really play live often, to be honest with you. Uh, yeah. But uh, when I do, it's in a, an environment that is more of a concert environment because that's the way that I came Very up. And, and uh, you know, when you play, you know, when I was on tour, you know, I would play small, what I would call listing room uh, type venues where they would have, you know, I don't know, anywhere from one to three, four hundred people. Right. But yeah. they came to hear me. Right. They didn't come to have a pizza and a beer. Maybe there's some guy playing background music in the corner. I mean, that's that's not me. I'm, I'm not going to do that. And and you I don't want to do that. Right. That's another thing. I feel like a lot of restaurants to bring money in and people, you know, people obviously want to listen to music while they're eating, whether it's, you know, like you were saying, a pizza place, something Italian or different types of music. I, I mean, when I go to a burger place and it's a weekend versus being a bar and everything in the back room, there is musicians. There's always mm -hmm. independent art. And I like that because it's a different type of feel for me. Whereas I'm just out with my family enjoying and Hey, they're playing a song that I know, which is a bonus because I want to sing along and I like their music and la da 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 da. So yes, it's probably a huge marketing tool also that you just brought to my attention because I didn't even think of <laughs> but, oh yeah, and and don't get me wrong; it's not a bad thing, right? Yeah, and a, and a yeah. lot of people love to do it. And like you said, you enjoy it when you go to a venue and there's some you have somebody playing some song that you know. Uh, and there's nothing yeah. wrong with it. Uh, uh, and I'm they're certainly not going to say anything bad about people that do it because that's what they do. Uh, it's just not for me. It's not for me. I, I don't like doing it. And, uh, you know, like I said, I'm fortunate that I don't have to. So I don't. When you were a musician, like starting off when you were younger, did you ever do any open mics? Or did you not? Uh, no. No. No, uh, yeah, no uh, I have a friend here in okay. Kansas City who hosts an open mic, right? And okay. uh, a really nice gal and, and just sweet as she could be. And every now and then she'll call me and say, Bill, will you come and play at our open mic? And, and I'll go, oh. you know, uh, and then play, play a couple of songs, you know. But uh, uh, again, you know, it, it, it's 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 the atmosphere, right? To me, it's the atmosphere. I really like to listen to music when I when I I'm listening to music. Right. Like, for example, yeah. uh, I was at a concert not too long ago. Uh uh, with some friends, right? And okay. it was it was somebody. It's like the Eagles or somebody, right? And and they said, I couldn't believe you. You stood the whole concert with your eyes closed. And I said, Yeah. And they said, Well, did you want to see the show? And I said, I didn't come for the show. I came for the music. I want to hear the music, right? Uh, okay. I've never heard anyone closing their eyes though at a concert. Yeah, I do it all the time. I've done it since I was a kid. You know, I mean, okay. there's. Uh, you know, there's a lot of, and, and again, don't take this the wrong way. There's a lot of people that enjoy the show. You know, if you look at uh, some of the some of the big artists today, you know, the Taylor, Usher, uh, these folks, it's a show. It's a yeah. production, right? Yeah, yeah. Because you feel so much where there's lights and there's yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'd rather just close my eyes and not see all that crap and listen to the music. That's my thing. And so okay. that's what's important to me, not to say that there's anything wrong with all the other stuff, right? Of course. It's, it's just not, opinion. it's just not who I am. You know, I would much rather just, you know, to be honest with you, I mean, the older I get, the less that I go out, right? So I'll, I'll sit here with a really nice stereo and a really nice 
glass of wine or a beer and I'll listen to you an entire album okay. uh, without interruption, you know, because I really like to listen to the music. The show is great and people enjoy it and, and more power to them, uh, but uh, not who I am. You know, I've never heard that in any of my times for interviewing anyone. And you know what? It's your opinion. Completely yeah. fine. It's 100% you. I've just never, I'm, I'm shocked. I think you stumped me on my own show. But you know what? That might be a different mentality to look at it, where you just close your eyes and actually focus on the music. I feel like when we do go to concerts and many different types of shows and events, we're always interested in things that are going on, whether I told you it's the lights or the merchandise or, or different mm -hmm. things going on or openers and everything like that. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's ever once in my life where I'm just standing or sitting and I close my eyes. I probably look like I'll be sound asleep at the concert. <laughs> could be. Yeah, could be. Or I fell asleep. But that's a, it's like a very strong mental point where... Honestly, I think a lot of people should look into that. Well, it depends on, I guess, the artist, right? So it depends yeah, on what kind of music you like and the artist and, and all yeah. that. You know, when you've got, uh, I'll use this as a great example, right? And there are others, but I'll just use this one as a great one. So one of my favorite artists of all time is Dan Fogelberg. Okay. And uh, Dan Fogelberg, you know, is known for the hits, you know, Longer and Leader of the Band and, you know, the run with the roses, yeah. you know, these hits, right? But here's what's fascinating about Dan Fogelberg. And I saw him in concert probably 10 times in my life, twice with a band, two times. Okay. The rest of the time, it was him and a piano and a guitar. So acoustic. that was a three hour concert, wow. right? Mm -hmm. Sold out Madison Square Garden two nights in a row with him, a guitar, and a piano. That is the kind of concert that I like to go to. Okay. To me, it just is, uh, it, it's more personal. It's more engaging and it's it's far more interesting to me. So there you go. That's, that's beautiful. Like I said, I never heard of it from that way. And I'm sure it's a strong mental point where you can learn from it a lot more. And actually understand the music as opposed to all of us screaming at the top of our lungs and getting a migraine after the show. <laughs> you know, but, but it also yeah. depends who you're seeing. But yeah, exactly. I, it depends on the artist. I mean, if you're going to go see, uh, I don't know, I, I hate to use Taylor names, Swift. but if, if you're going to go see Taylor Swift, right, you expect to see the show. You know, you expect her to come out there half naked, right, sing a bunch of songs that sound a whole lot alike. Right. But yeah. she's got a huge bunch of dancers. She's got a great band, fantastic yep. sound that's and a big you're... production. Program. And that's what that's what that audience. That's what likes. Yeah. yeah. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. More power to you. I'm going to sit at home and listen to an acoustic Jackson Brown album and be just tickled to death. All right. So it just depends on what your tastes are. Definitely. Bill, you're, you're incredible. I really enjoyed love talking to you, getting to know you. Honestly, you've been through so much where it seems like it's always a learning curve for yourself and your career. And that's also very strong in a very positive way for you that you have a lot going on for you. And you know, you're a dad and you have a lot of time and you're working with a lot of stuff. I know we talked a little bit as well in the beginning of the show where you previously have like new music that you're working on or an album. So it seems like you always have something coming on are happening, which is great because it's super interactive and fun for you. And yeah, I don't do I've, I don't I do board well. <laughs> I, Same I, with I your really show host. I can't get bored. It's it's really it's really hard um for me to try to get bored, you know, for anything like that. But I yeah. just have to say I appreciate your time, you know, well, being thank here you with me much. today. And it was really nice talking to you. I wish you so much luck and love in the industry. I really can't wait to hear more of the music that you're releasing into the new year, whether it's this spring or summer or fall. And um, like I said, thank you again. If you just want to give out your social media, where people can find you and your music, or if you have a website, you're more than welcome to so we can get ready to end the show. 
Yeah, that's, I'll just tell you. That, so I'm everywhere, right? So I'm not going <laughs> to give you a bunch of Twitter handles and or X handles, I suppose, a Facebook page. Go to BillAbernathy.com, BillAbernathy.com. And on my website is a bunch of stuff that you can read out about me, but it's also all the links into all the social media junk. And, and uh, you know, I post on there kind of, you know, two or three times a week. I'm not one of those guys that's going to post Whatever every day. Time. But when something You're happens, down. when something happens and something is of interest, I'll post it, right? But but uh, I'm not going to blow up your Facebook page. I'm not going to blow up your Instagram or your Twitter, you know, or your email. Uh, I'm just not that guy. So when something cool happens, like today is, is today Tuesday? Yes. So today, sometime this evening, I will get radio reports for the week. That okay. will be interesting, you know, see where I'm charting, how many stations. I think last week it was 650 stations or something were playing my music. So that's pretty cool, right? So, wow. yeah, that, that's cool. interesting. That's interesting. And I'll share that, you know, with, with folks. But uh, uh, I'm not going to tell you, hey, look, I got a new pair of jeans. This is not who I am at all, right? It's going to have to be something a little bit more interesting. Like if I got a new guitar, I'd probably put that out. And then what's her name? Because I'm sure she's going to be somebody from Lord of the Rings. Uh, the new guitar. I don't know. You, 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 each guitar has its own personality. So you don't really know until you play them. Right. And then they, they tell you who they are. So. I love that. Like I said, you're incredible. You're such a wonderful musician. I loved having you today. You're so open and honest. And you made me laugh so much about the industry. And honestly, can everyone be like you? How honest you are? It's insane. Well, all, all I can say is this, and I'm, and I'm not going to dog on Taylor Swift because she's kind of popular in Kansas City because she's dating this guy that plays on the Chiefs, right? So, uh, yeah. But a couple of weeks ago on one of the national charts, I was actually number two on the chart, and she was number three. And I thought to myself, hey, look, I'm number two, and I'm ahead of Taylor Swift, and I didn't have to take my clothes off on stage or anything. So it must be a good thing. That's a joke. I love it. I seriously, oh, my God, are you half comedian? It's perfect. I love the comical part of you. It's awesome getting to know you. It really, really is. I have to appreciate you being here again. I really do love talking to you. Um, when you have a new release of an album, you're more than welcome to contact us again. We'll introduce you back on the show. We'll promote your album where people can purchase it and buy it and go from there. Perfect. And I wish you the best of your Tuesday. I hope you have a great one. And thank you again for being here tonight. Y'all yeah, have a great night. Thank you very much for asking interesting questions and having a good interview. So uh, that's that's uh, that's a little bit rare in today's world. So thank you very much. And brought up by my to, dad. So thank uh, you. To the, tell your dad he's doing a good job. So for the rest of you, live long and prosper. Have a good night, everyone. Make sure you guys tune in every Tuesday from six thirty to seven thirty Eastern Standard Time. Good night, everyone. Let's go. All right.